Hello, this is Tim Halbach from the National Weather Service Milwaukee Sullivan Office. This presentation is intended for third to sixth graders that are in school and going through their weather units. This is going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do here at the National Weather Service and some of the types of weather that we get here in Wisconsin. So here's a couple of pictures from our interior part of the office as well as our Doppler radar here. A lot of activity when we have some sort of winter storm that's forecast or uh, a severe weather event that we have here in Wisconsin. So a lot of different things that we get into and we'll cover that through the talk today. And here's a look from the outside of our office. One of the main eye catcher there is our big uh, Doppler radar up on the hill. Some of the kids call it our soccer ball or volleyball or water tower. But that's our, our main tool to be able to tell where thunderstorms are, where a winter storm might be as well. We have a lot of other different types of equipment that we have at our, at our office to measure the weather. We have a rain gauge, which measures how much rainfall we get. We have uh, snowboards and equipment there that measure how much snow we get. And we also have different things like an anemometer, which measures the wind speeds, and a thermometer that measures uh, what the temperature is. So a lot of different equipment that we have here. There's a lot of other sites that have equipment like this spread out across the United States. A lot of them are at airports or in people's backyards where they like to observe the weather. So here's our beautiful location in eastern Jefferson County. We're just in between Sullivan and Dousman in uh, that part of uh, southeastern Wisconsin. The National Weather Service is part of the federal government under the Department of Commerce and NOAA. And throughout the United States, there's 122 different local National Weather Service offices, much like our own in uh, Milwaukee Sullivan. Here in Wisconsin, there's five different offices that have different areas that they cover. And all these forecast offices are responsible for the forecasts and warnings for those areas. So for our office, we cover from the Dells in Sauk County over to Sheboygan County on down to the Illinois border. And from there, we collaborate with all the other different uh, weather service offices that are around us so that you don't get a big jump in the forecast or big changes. So in our office, we have 24 people that work there. 19 of them are meteorologists, four are technicians, and one is an administrative assistant. For the meteorologists, we all have a degree in atmospheric sciences from uh, universities. There's a few in Wisconsin that you could go to, UW-Madison or Milwaukee. Um, otherwise, there's plenty across the United States you can go to to get this degree. And to get to that point, you have to be really good in math, science, computer sciences, and also communications. We do a lot of uh, trying to communicate out what we think is going to happen with the forecast, and we have to talk to people to say what we think is going to happen. So you have to be good in that as well. Our, for our office and many of the other offices in the United States, we have at least two people, two meteorologists that are working all, all day long. Um, so we have two people that work a morning shift, two people that are on a day shift, and two people that are on an evening shift. So there's always coverage at our office, even on the weekends and when there's holidays, so that you're getting updated of what the forecast is and what is going to be coming your way. Doppler radar is one of the best tools that we have to be able to tell where precipitation is, where a storm might be, or how intense a snowstorm is. It's uh, what We have these deployed across the United States. We have one in our backyard at our office at the Milwaukee Sullivan National Weather Service. What this dish does is it sends out a pulse of energy and then it sits and listens for that energy to get reflected back to the radar. And based on how long it takes for that pulse to go out and then get reflected back to the radar, it's able to map out exactly where the heavy rainfall is, how intense it is, and uh, you know, where exactly that that is as well so we use that to be able to look for different characteristics is it a big hailstorm that's coming through or different weather uh, storm types uh, the loop here is a super south thunderstorm that we had go through the Washington and Ozaki County areas from uh, April 7th of 2020 and that produced some golf ball to almost tennis ball size hail there The Doppler radar is a great tool for us to be able to put out warnings before severe weather happens. 
So we have different things that we look at when it comes to putting out tornado warnings. There's a lot of times where it might be the middle of the night, and if we wait to get a report that a tornado has happened, it's going to be too late. So our goal is to get about 10 to 15 minutes of heads up that this tornado is coming your way. And we use that based on uh, what's happening with the, with the storms itself and then whether or not we see any rotation in it. So this is an example of the radar loop from the uh, tornadoes we had. Uh, there was an EF0 that went through Fort Atkinson and then we had an EF1 that was really close to our office. And I'm gonna pause this and zoom in a little bit at one of the points here where just a few miles from our office, this rotation came through. So the field on the left is the reflectivity. That's the one we just talked about. So it, you know, how much rainfall is occurring or how much stuff is out there. The image on the right is velocity. So the, the bright pinks that are moving away from the radar, the bright pinks and oranges and reds, those are motions that are moving away from the radar. And anything that's green is a motion that's moving towards the radar. So right in here is where we knew that that rotation was going through and we followed that along to be able to pin down exactly where that tornado was going and, uh, and what cities were potentially in the way. So this is a, it's a, a key part of one of the things that we do at our office and that's issuing those tornado warnings so that people can stay safe and be prepared for when a potential tornado is going to come through. So there are other things besides uh, thunderstorms and snowstorms that we can pick up on our radar. We can actually pick up on other things like mayflies. This is out in the La Crosse area. They get millions of these bugs that pop up in the middle of summer uh, in the evening and overnight hours, and they just live for one day and then they go away. You can kind of see on the La Crosse radar there where they kind of pulses up, and then there's actually storms happening to the south of there as well. Uh, but those are harmless kind of bugs there. The birds on the right hand side, this is off of Green Bay's radar and you can kind of see the ring that comes out of the Marinette area there by uh, Green Bay and uh, those, those can show up there too. There's other offices that actually down in Texas you can see the bats coming out at night. Just makes a, a ring like that as they leave their roost and, and fly away. Another great tool that we have is satellite. So this is our new GOES 17, uh, 16 and 17 satellite that's out in outer space. This just rotates along with the, the rotation of the Earth and gives us pictures of what is happening back there. So we see the, the tops of the clouds. It's like having a camera or uh, 16 different types of cameras all on one satellite sending you pictures back of what's happening at the Earth's surface. So one of the fields that we get is visible satellite and the, the new upgrade has really allowed us to see some really cool things on satellite. So this is a minute by minute loop of thunderstorms happening down in the Houston area and you can actually see the, the thunderstorms developing there and then uh, falling apart as they move further to the east. Uh, but the detail and what we can see here is, is pretty, pretty amazing. This is just if you were to have like a regular camera on out in outer space and taking pictures and sending it back that's what this is it's looking at just what the the sky looks like one of the issues with that is that we might not always be able to see what's happening overnight so at the nighttime hours we have something called infrared satellite and this sends us pictures back of how intense the thunderstorms might be or where the clouds might be and the brighter the colors here all the reds and yellows uh, that you see on the loop here show uh, the temperature of the clouds. So the higher up you go in the Earth's atmosphere, typically the colder it gets. So when you get those really cold temperatures on the tops of the clouds, that tells you that you've got a pretty intense thunderstorm that's occurring there. So that's one of the things we look at when we're trying to forecast how bad a, a storm might be. We actually look at the infrared satellite to see what those cloud top temperatures actually are. So this, temp this, uh, this image lets us see where the clouds are overnight. Our satellite also gives us some images of where lightning is occurring. So we can use that to be able to tell, again, how intense the storm might be. The more lightning that's associated with it might be telling you that there's an uptick in the intensifying storm. So this is another good way for us to be able to get a sense of how bad a storm may or may not be or just where lightning is occurring. So this is a, a satellite lightning loop from April 7th, 2020, as storms got out of Wisconsin and then went in, 
to Michigan and uh, Northern Illinois. Another good thing that our satellite does is it gives us uh, pictures of hurricanes. We don't have other equipment out over the oceans where we can watch for uh, where the hurricanes are. So we have to rely on satellites to be able to tell us where exactly a hurricane is and how intense it might be. So this was Hurricane Dorian as it went through the Bahamas back in 2019 in September. Um, spent about 36 hours where it didn't even move um, across the Grand Bahama Island here. So the, the middle part here is the, the eye of the hurricane. That's uh, the center of it and one of the things that we look at to be able to tell how intense a hurricane actually is when it's very uh, symmetric like that where it's a, a perfect circle that's a sign that it's a very intense hurricane that's occurring and once it gets a little bit more ragged and falls apart then um, it starts to lose its intensity a little bit so you can see from the beginning through about this point now it's starting to lose a bit of its intensity because that that eye wall is not as symmetrical of a, of a shape as what it was earlier still a very intense hurricane for what they had there Here's a close-up view of that same Hurricane Dorian as it approached the Bahamian Islands. Um, there's hurricane hunters that'll fly through the hurricane and actually measure the, the wind speeds and the pressure so that the meteorologists can have a good idea of how intense that hurricane actually is and whether the forecast models are doing a, a good job of being able to, to predict where the hurricane's gonna go and how intense it's gonna be. Another bit of equipment we have are weather balloons. So this is from our Springfield office in 50 mile per hour winds. So that weather balloon goes up through the Earth's atmosphere and measures how fast the winds actually were. And when uh, it goes from the ground all the way up, we can get an idea of what the temperatures are, how humid it is, and which way the winds are going as well. It tells us a lot of things about what's happening, not just at the ground, but well above the ground as well. So it's a very useful tool um, and bit of information that we need to know about every day. That information also goes into our forecast models, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So how do we predict the weather? We use forecast models to give us a sense of what's gonna happen with our future weather. So these are computers that try to model the Earth's atmosphere and it's all based upon the starting point of what the radar, satellites, anything that we have at, um, at the ground measuring what the temperatures and dew points and uh, pressure might be, the, the weather balloon that you just saw, all that information gives a starting point for these forecast models and then they have the equations of motion for how the Earth's atmosphere works and it moves things forward and it gives us an idea of uh, what we think might happen with the weather. So this was from February of this past year where we had a snowstorm come through Wisconsin and we had uh, quite a bit of snow that occurred from this snowstorm as it, as it came through on that Sunday. So this is what we use to predict the weather. They're not always completely accurate but we have a bunch of different types of forecast models that tell us, um, give us our confidence in how a situation might unfold. Okay, so let's talk about some of the different weather types that we get here in Wisconsin. Uh, we get, during the summertime, we get thunderstorms and we get lightning. This is a super slow motion of, uh, of a lightning bolt or lightning strike that happened here from a photographer named Tim Samaras, a storm chaser. Uh, you can see how the, just approaches the ground there. And once it makes contact, there's that channel that goes from the, from the ground up to the storm. Uh, but if you're outside, our, our slogan is, if thunder roars, go indoors. So if you're close enough to hear thunder, that's the time for you to go inside. Um, there's times you could see lightning off in the distance from a thunderstorm that's pretty far away. But if uh, you're close enough to hear thunder, that means it's time to go inside. Um, after that last thunder that you hear, wait about a half hour before you go back outside. So better to be safe. Here's an example of where that lightning strike hit the ground at a golf course. And you can see where the brown paths are, where the electricity went across the, the top of the green here. So if you're standing on that, when uh, that th lightning hit the ground, uh, you probably would have been electrocuted from that. So best just to be inside. If you're inside or even in a car, 
those are safe spots to be in as long as the car is a, a hard topped car and not a convertible. Hailstorm, we get these in Wisconsin. So this was uh, from West Bend from this past April, and uh, we had some golf ball sized hail that occurred. Not very often that we get big hailstorms, but uh, we had one in uh, 2020 here that actually had some tennis ball sized hail in some spots around uh, West Bend when that thing came through. Here's a couple pictures of some very large hail. Uh, the guy on the left here is holding the US record hailstone, which was eight inches wide, which is about the size of a bowling ball, uh, weighed about one pound. So not quite as heavy as a bowling ball, but you can imagine that big chunk of uh, ice falling out of the sky. And then uh, on the right here, this kid here is holding Wisconsin's second largest hailstone that was ever measured at five and a half inches wide. So that's bigger than the size of a softball. And that was from June 2007 in Port Edwards, which is in the west central part of the state. So it's not very often we get that big a hail, but it has happened before. Get strong thunderstorm winds. The video on the left is from Waukesha, 2019. That's about 60 mile per hour winds. Oh my god. See with the middle one here. This was from Racine uh, with the, those strong winds that they had there. And one last one here from Laura on Oconomowoc. Oh, I my truck. Sometimes thunderstorms can have multiple hazards. Hopefully nobody was in the, the porta potty there as the wind blew that over. So when we have thunderstorms that have winds over 58 miles per hour, or having hail larger than the size of quarters, we consider that to be a severe thunderstorm. So my office puts out severe thunderstorm warnings to let people know that that's on their way. So that's when we start seeing more damage from the wind speeds and also from the, the large hail that's occurring there as well. So we, our goal is to try to keep people safe. With the straight line winds, it's uh, a lot for people that are camping or maybe boating that need to know about that uh, bad wind that's coming their way. The large hail, uh, normally it's just uh, maybe you got to park your car inside a garage or something like that so that it doesn't get all dented up. We do get tornadoes here in Wisconsin as well. This is one of the more recent stronger tornadoes that we've had, the Stoughton F3 tornado from 2005. It's been a little while since we've had a tornado of this uh, strength here in Wisconsin. There was one in 2014 in Verona, kind of in the same area as that one. But um, it's, been, it's been a while since we've had anything larger than that uh, here in Wisconsin. Oakfield was the last F5, and that was in 1996. But we do get tornadoes. Most of them are on the weaker side, though. For tornadoes, we base the, the strength of the tornado on the damage that occurs from it. So after a tornado has occurred, we go out and we look at the damage um, how long the path was, where it started, where it ended. And based on what we see from the damage, we're able to put it on the scale called the Enhanced Fujita scale or the EF scale. And it goes from zero to five. And again, based on the damage that occurs, we give it a rating. And from that, we can estimate how fast the wind speeds actually were. So almost all the tornadoes that we get in Wisconsin are typically in the zero to two range. And thankfully, we don't see a whole lot of injuries or fatalities occurring from those levels of tornadoes. But unfortunately, when you do have a, an EF3, 4, or 5, there's a much more higher likelihood that there could be fatalities or injuries that occur because of the strength of that type of a, a tornado. So thankfully, we don't get those very often here in Wisconsin, but they have occurred in the past. Oakfield is the last F5 that's occurred, and that was back in 1996. Last year, in um, 2019, we had 28 tornadoes in Wisconsin. All of them were either zeros or ones, except for one that was up by Elk Mound, which was an EF3. So when we, one of the main things that our office does is issues tornado warnings. So either we see something on radar that is, ro is, ro is a rotation that is causing us to issue the warning, 
or somebody has reported it to us. Our goal is to be able to get that warning out early so that people will be able to respond to the warning and uh, get shelter before that tornado actually even occurs. So the tornado warnings are either prompted by what we're seeing on radar or somebody reporting it into us. The last type of weather we'll talk about is winter storms. So we do get big blizzards here in Wisconsin. This is uh, some images from the Groundhog's Day blizzard in 2011. Uh, when we get snow that is accompanied by strong winds, we can get big snow drifts like this. I'm sure a lot of the kids hope for days like this where we can you get out of school in the middle of winter. But uh, those are some of the things that we get here in Wisconsin. Normally we get like one or two winter storms per year very rare to be able to get anything over a foot. And with that, that concludes our presentation. There's a lot of other different types of weather that we didn't get into here, but uh, that might be something good to discuss with your teachers about what else did we not cover that we get here in Wisconsin, like fog or other types of things with thunderstorms. So thank you very much and hope you all have a great day.